A few weeks ago, I reviewed the IRIX 11mm f4 lens, and I was very impressed by that lens. I thought, especially for the money that you were paying, it was a really good performing lens, and there are not many alternatives on the market with that sort of a focal length for that sort of price. And today, I will be reviewing the other lens that IRIX currently has in their lineup, namely this, the 15mm f2.4. So can this live up to the performance of its 11 millimeter brother? So I will kick this off by saying a big thank you to Irix for loaning me a lens for a few weeks to be able to test and do a review on. But I need to obviously stipulate as well, this is not a sponsored review in any way, shape or form. Irix are not telling me what to say. They have simply agreed to loan me a copy of the lens and these are my thoughts and opinions from using it. Now, if you want to check out the 11mm review, I will leave a link for it up here. I'll also put a link in the description down below. But just to recap, Irix currently have two lenses in their lineup, the 11mm f4 and the 15mm f2.4. Both of these lenses come in two variations, the Firefly and the Blackstone. Now the Firefly is their lower budget version of the lens, while the Blackstone is their more expensive premium version. The 11mm that I reviewed a few weeks ago was a Firefly version of the lens, and this 15mm is the Blackstone version of the lens. Now the only fundamental difference between the Firefly and the Blackstone is the external construction of the barrel. There are no other differences apart from that. The optics of both versions remain exactly the same. Both lenses are weather sealed to the same extent as well. The only difference is simply that the Firefly's barrel is made of plastic, while the Blackstone's version is made of metal. So let's kick things off and get the box open. Now inside these boxes, Irix ship all of their lenses in a very nice premium tin. The Firefly's tin is white, the Blackstone's is black, but they're both tins. There's some very premium level Irix logos on the tin and a nice etching of the lens itself as well. But obviously all this is just for decoration. And the lens is designed in Switzerland and made in Korea. It's probably the best combination of doing that. When you open the tins up, if you get the Firefly version of the lens, it comes in a, a soft carry pouch. If you get the Blackstone version, it comes in one of these lovely looking cases, which is a kind of, a, it feels like a plastic chassis with a, a fabric overlay. It, it's a very nice pouch to be fair. I've never seen a lens come in anything like this before, but we aren't that fussed about the case, more what is inside it. And what is inside it is this. Now this lens looks very similar to the 11 mm f4, apart from one big difference. Unlike the 11 mm this has a detachable lens hood. The 11 mm it's incorporated into the body because it has a much larger bulbous front element. And because this lens doesn't have the same big bulbous front element as the 11 mm either, it's got a much smaller pinch cap over the front of it, which is hiding a 95 mm front filter, which is kind of a big thing for a wide angle lens because the majority of lenses currently on the market that go wider than 16 millimeters don't have a front filter. Most of them, you would have to have an external square filter holder to go over the top of it. Now, while we're on the topic of screw on front filters, along with shipping me this lens for review, Irix were kind enough to also include a couple of their edge filters as well. So kind of incorporated into this lens review video a bit later on, I'm going to be discussing how these filters perform. So the externals of the lens feels very nice to hold. You can tell straight away just from the touch of it that this is the Blackstone version because you can feel the metal. You can feel the barrel is physically colder than my hand, whereas if it was the Firefly version with the plastic barrel, it didn't feel the same. But while the Blackstone is their more premium version, and is a tougher feeling body. I do need to stress that when I tested the Firefly version of the 11 millimeter, I did actually say that even for a plastic lens, it felt pretty tough. So I don't think you're gonna be disappointed with either lens, but while the Firefly version does feel pretty tough and for the kind of stuff that I do, I feel it would be more than adequate for what I need. 
I think if you are somebody who is going into a lot more rugged terrain, maybe punishing the lens a little bit more, you might appreciate the slightly sturdier feel of the metal barrel. Now, there are two adjustable rings on the barrel. The main one is the focus ring, which has focus distance markers etched in. And both of the Irix lenses also have a nice feature to them, which is a kind of semi-soft click at the infinity marker. So if you're out and about in dark conditions and you've not got a light on the lens and you want to find infinity, you've just got to feel for the click rather than find the torch, which is a nice feature to have. The second ring is located at the top of the focus ring here and it allows you to increase or decrease the amount of resistance in the focus ring to the point where you can pretty much lock it solid which is a nice feature to have because if you know you're going to be shooting for a long period of time at one consistent focus distance then you can just get focus lock the focus ring into that position and not have to worry that you're accidentally going to knock it or it's going to drift out of focus and your shots are going to start appearing blurred. Now, one thing I mentioned about the 11mm lens was regarding the focus ring that it felt a little bit too stiff. I'm happy to report that the focus ring on this lens does feel a little bit looser. Strangely enough, though, I have noticed that if you're winding the focus from infinity towards minimum, it feels like it's tightening up towards the end of the focus throw. As you get towards minimum focus distance, it does feel like the focus ring is getting that little bit harder to turn. And then if you're at minimum focus distance and you go towards infinity, it feels like it gets looser and looser. Maybe it's just my head playing tricks on me, but it definitely feels somewhere around about there, close to minimum focus distance, the focus ring feels a little bit stiffer. But overall, the focus ring is pretty nice. It's certainly nicer than the 11 millimeter. The only thing I don't know is whether the difference in the focus ring stiffness is due to a difference between the 11mm and the 15mm or a difference between the Firefly and the Blackstone or maybe a combination of the two, I don't know. Neither of them are particularly unusable, it's just if you shoot video you might want to try it out first just to make sure that it's not too stiff for what you need. As I mentioned at the start, this lens is weather sealed. Both the Firefly and the Blackstone come with the same degrees of weather sealing. So there's a rubber gasket on the back here. There are also rubber gaskets underneath the contact point to the focus ring. So the whole lens is completely sealed as well. Now, while the lens is manual focus, it's not manual aperture. The aperture is electronically controlled by the camera. So there are electronic contacts on the back. Now, I've been doing all my testing of this lens using my Sony a7 III body, and I've been using the Sigma MC11 adapter to connect the two together. And there's been absolutely no issues with the lens and the camera talking to each other and being able to control the aperture quite happily. Only thing regarding the aperture that I will point out, and it's more just an FYI, is that the lens is an f2.4 lens, but the cameras don't register it as being an f2.4. They all record it as being f2.5. Reason being, I believe, is because if you look at the one-third increments of the f-stop values, it goes f2, f2.2, f2.5, f2.8. So I don't think the cameras can read f2.4. Even though the lens is 2.4, it just gets recorded in the camera as f2.5. It's not a big deal. It's just in case you happen to look at the EXIF data and wonder what the hell's going on. And lastly, on the externals, we have the lens hood. Now, as I've already mentioned, the 15mm differs from the 11 because it has a removable lens hood, obviously. But the lens hood for me comes under a little bit of criticism here. The lens hood itself is plastic. Now, that's not a big deal. I don't mind about that. In fact, it's probably just a uniform part that they ship with both the Firefly and the Blackstone. It's perfectly fine. What throws me about the lens hood is... Every other lens hood that I've ever used, I've known to have a 90 degree kind of quarter turn to lock it in place. So you would put the lens hood on sideways, turn it a quarter turn to click it in fully. This doesn't. This only has a 45 degree turn. It's not a huge deal. It's just I'm so in the habit from all my other lenses mounting sideways that I do the same with this. And it will go on sideways and lock into place. But obviously that's not gonna do much for your pictures. Now, when fitting the lens hood, there's kind of a noticeable click to let you know it's in place. And it is pretty secure once it's in, you know, even tapping the top of it there doesn't shift it out of place. So, you know, once the hood's on, there's no chance of it coming loose. 
The only thing I've found with it is it is a little bit stiff sometimes trying to get it into place. There have been a couple of times where I've had to kind of double check and make sure it's not cross-threaded because it kind of feels like it's, it's not sitting properly. Even though it is, it's just a little bit stiff to get into place. But once it's in, it's secure as anything. Last feature on the lens hood. It's a nice little feature. I just think it's kind of redundant. And that's here. They fitted a little sliding slot window for you to be able to access the inside of the lens hood. Now, you don't generally see that kind of feature on wide angle lenses such as this. This is generally found on longer telephoto lenses, like this is the lens hood off my Sony 100 to 400, and the Canon version also has the same feature. So the idea with this is if you're using like a circular polarizing filter, you would have to frame up your subject and then spin the polarizing filter to get the kind of look that you are going for. So if you're trying to use a long lens with a long hood, it's kind of difficult to get your hands in the front of the hood to be able to spin the filter, especially when you've got the lens held out here trying to see what you're doing. You can't really turn the filter at all. So they started fitting these little window slots so you could just pop your finger into the hood and spin the filter nice and easy. They fitted the same feature on this hood, but for me personally, I kind of feel it's a little bit redundant. Because with these lens hoods, one, you kind of need it because the filter's so much further away from you and the hood's so much bigger, it's difficult to physically get at the filter itself. Secondly, because the hood is so long, the window slot can be made quite big and I can fit my fingers in nice and easy. But with this lens, firstly, one, the slot's not very big, so I can't really fit my fingers in properly. Second, there's such a sharp edge on this here, I've lost track of the number of times I've, I've kind of nicked my finger on the edge there. But if I fit a circular polarizing filter onto this lens, and then I put the lens hood back in place, I kind of struggle to actually turn the filter at all through the slot. I'm physically cannot do it but because the lens hood's so shallow i've actually found it's a lot easier to just spin it with your fingers through the front of the lens so so the window slot was a nice feature to include but i don't really think it's needed on this sort of lens had it been a longer focal length with a bigger hood probably would have made a bit more sense but for this i've not actually used that window at all when i'm out in the field and on the topic of filters as i said Irix also sent me some of their edge filters. Now, these are 95mm filters designed to fit the 15mm lens, but they're not specifically for this lens. They will go with any lens. Now, I have been pretty impressed with these filters, to be fair. They do feel like very good quality filters. I have done some testing round with them as well. So when we get into the image quality section in a minute, I've also done some test shots and some comparisons with the filters on as well. So you can see how much of a difference they make to the images. So Irix have been kind enough to send me a circular polarizer, a UV filter, and my personal favorite, their ND3200, which is a 15 stop ND filter. This thing is absolutely amazing at being able to pull long exposures even in broad daylight. So let's delve into the image quality tests. Okay, let's get through the nitty gritty technical test and then we'll move on to some more real world images. So this was shot wide open at f2.4. First two things we'll bring up with this is the distortion and the vignetting. So the distortion on this image does seem quite noticeable, particularly with the straight lines at the top and bottom. Realistically though, this is more to do with how close the lens is to the wall in the first place, not so much the physics of the lens. You'll see in a minute with the more real world photos that actually the distortion on this lens is fairly well controlled considering how wide an angle lens it is. Now the vignetting wide open at f2.4 is pretty noticeable again this is kind of a trait of wide angle lenses like this there's no real getting around it now sharpness in the center of the frame wide open is pretty good it's not exceptional it's kind of on par with the similar sort of lenses in the same sort of price point sharpness in the corners is okay it's not as sharp as the center but it's holding its own fairly well when we stop down to f4, we see probably the biggest improvement on this lens. The vignetting clears up quite nicely. There's still some there, but not as much as there was. 
and sharpness both in the center of the frame and in the corners does improve quite a lot. The lens hits peak sharpness in the center of the frame at f5.6. Stopping down any further than 5.6 doesn't really yield any better results in the center of the frame. The corners, however, do continue to sharpen up until you hit about f11. Now, as I mentioned earlier as well, I've also got the three Irix Edge filters to test out. The UV filter, the polarizing filter, and the neutral density filter. So before we move on, let's just have a quick look and see how much of a difference, if any, these filters have on the overall image quality. Now, these were all shot at f5.6. And first up, we have the UV filter. Now, you can see compared the left image, which is without a filter, to the right image, you can kind of see there's a bit of a slightly warmer colors from using the UV filter. It's kind of put a bit more of an orange glow to the image having the filter on. In terms of sharpness, one of the big negatives I found of UV filters was primarily people tend to use cheap UV filters and they just soften the image so much. With the Irix Edge filters, however, you can see that that's just not the case. Both in the center of the frame and in the corners, the image is just as sharp with the filter as without. Next up, we have the circular polarizing filter. And this is pretty much the same sort of story. Sharpness wise, you don't really see any noticeable degradation in the image sharpness. The only thing with this polarizing filter, and it's the same with all polarizing filters really, you lose about a stop of light. Because you're polarizing the light, you're only letting a certain type of light get through the filter. So that cuts how much light is actually getting into the lens. Lastly, the neutral density filter. This was the filter that I felt was going to struggle, if any of them. And to be fair, it's done a really good job. It's a 15 stop ND filter. So I've had to go from a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second without a filter to over five and a half minutes with the filter. So ND filters of this magnitude can cause problems for your image, particularly budget filters I've found in the past soften the image quite a lot and also put very peculiar color casts to the images as well. That's not so much the case with the Irix filters. In terms of sharpness, you can see there's really no drop in sharpness at all from using these filters. The only thing with this filter is it does add a bit of an orange glow to your images, which isn't a huge deal, to be honest. It's very easy to edit out. All ND filters of this sort of level are going to present some discoloration to your images, but this filter is one of the better performing filters that I've seen from such a big stop ND filter. Now, in terms of flare in this lens is a bit of a double edged sword. It is advertised as having neutrino coating, which Irix states are supposed to reduce flaring and ghosting. Now, overall, I found this lens does show a degree of flaring, but generally it's fairly well controlled. But if you point the lens straight at the light source, you get a very noticeable halo around the entire image. It is worth noting that that flaring pattern is only present when you point directly at the light source. And realistically, how often are you ever going to do that? Now, in terms of close up image quality, this isn't really a macro lens, but it does allow you to get reasonably close to your subjects. And mixed with such a wide angle field of view as well, does kind of create some interesting looking photographs. And in terms of close-up image quality, it's really the same sort of story. At f2.4, it's not the sharpest lens, realistically. It does an okay job, but it's not mind-blowingly sharp. Stop down to f4, though, you do see a huge difference in close-up image quality. That's not to say it's unusable at f2.4. If you look at this picture of my dog, for example, focused in on the eye, wide open at f2.4, the lens still renders a pretty sharp image. I'll be honest, for the most part that I've been using this lens, even though I've had f2.4 available, I've actually rarely been using it anyway, not because I've been put off by any image quality issues. Generally, most of the things that you shoot with a wide angle lens like this, you don't want that wide an aperture anyway, you want a slightly deeper depth of field. 
generally the only time I've made a conscious effort to use this lens wide open is when I've been shooting astrophotography, which unfortunately due to weather, I've not been able to do a huge amount on, but I did get out to do some testing of it in terms of coma. There is a small degree of coma in the corner of the frame wide open, but considering the price point of this lens, it's better than I was expecting. So in terms of optical performance, wide open at f2.4, it's not the sharpest lens around. Once you've got the lens stopped down a little bit from kind of f4 onwards, that image quality does rank pretty well. But with the 11mm f4, it impressed me because it was such an unusual design for the money. You know, there was only one other 11mm DSLR lens on the market, and that was the Canon 11 to 24mm f4, which was five times the price or something stupid. I mean, but this lens falls into an area of the market that has a lot more competition around. I mean, currently I've seen this thing priced everywhere from between 400 to 500 pounds for the Firefly version, and then the Blackstone's a little bit more expensive. But by comparison, you've got the original Samyang 14mm f2.8, which is probably two, 300 pounds you can get that for these days secondhand. Yes, it is a fully manual lens. It's not quite as good optically. And it's a 2.8, not a 2.4. And you can't have screw-on filters either. But it is a millimeter wider and it is a lot cheaper. Samyang also do the 14mm f2.4 SP. So is a 2.4 the same as this, but it's still a millimeter wider. Granted, it still can't accept front filters, but it is sharper f2.4 than this is. But it is also like, nearly double the price so swings and roundabouts samyang have also released the 14 millimeter f 2.8 af so has autofocus which whether you need that on a wide angle lens or not but it is a little bit more expensive and it still can't have filters you've got the canon 14 millimeter f 2.8 which is a damn sight more expensive than this and probably not worth the money for most people to be honest because optically i don't think it's that much better than what the irix offers you have also got the Yongnuo 14mm f2.8, which I reviewed several months ago, which compared to this is a similar sort of price. Optically, it's the same sort of story. At f2.8, it's not the best, but by the time you stop it down to f4, it is pretty good. But that doesn't have any weather sealing at all. That is also a pretty front-heavy lens, and it doesn't accept front filters either. There are also like 16 to 35s. The Canon 16 to 35 f4 isn't obviously quite as wide as this because it's a 16 rather than a 15 millimeter. Optically at f4, there's probably not a huge amount of difference, but you do get the versatility of a zoom and optical stabilization. But it is an f4 rather than f2.4, so you're looking at over a stop of light lost. You could consider the Canon 16 to 35 f2.8, but the Mark III, while being optically better, is also a stupidly amount more expensive. You've got the Mark II version, which isn't as expensive as the Mark III, but is still more expensive than this, and optically, probably not a huge amount of difference either. The only other 15mm for DSLRs that spring to mind are the Zeiss 15mm f2.8, the Milvus and the Distagons and stuff. They are optically obviously a lot better than this and can also accept 95mm front filters the same as this. But with the price that they are, I probably couldn't afford filters if I'd bought one. I think that's all the DSLR competitors. I know, I know, how could I forget the Sigma 14mm f1.8? That is a lot more expensive and a lot bigger and heavier and can't accept front filters but it is a whole f-stop brighter as well. Back to it. I'll be honest, if I was still on a DSLR system and I was looking for this sort of lens, this would be the one that I would go for. It definitely seems like the best value for money by far. Unfortunately, I'm not on a DSLR system. I am on a mirrorless system. On mirrorless, it's a whole different ball game. For example, Lauer do a 15 millimeter f two which is a fully manual lens but optically it's in the same sort of region as this isn't that much more expensive than this but is a lot smaller and can take 72 millimeter front filters rather than 95 millimeters so unfortunately as much as i have loved shooting with this lens and if i was still shooting dslr i would happily get this lens 
on a mirrorless camera, if I was looking for this sort of fast aperture, wide angle lens, I would probably look to the Lauer over this just because it's so much smaller and lighter and the filters are so much more convenient and cheaper to buy as well. I think if Irix could redesign this lens and scale it down to mirrorless, it would be absolutely fantastic. But that's it for this video, guys. What do you make of the Irix lenses, the 15 and the 11 millimeter? Have you used them? Have you been impressed with them? Have you liked the look of what you've seen of them and you're considering buying them? I will leave links to the lenses in the description box below. Let me know your thoughts and comments down there as well. Thank you so much for stopping by and hopefully I will see you in the next video.